So, any codec moments from you, Snake? The first image is... Oh, I don't think we can use this. When it comes to the most divisive entries in video game series, well, good luck finding one bigger than Metal Gear Solid 2. And it usually seems whenever you try to talk to people about this thing, they either seem to love it or hate it. I'm someone who falls into the former category though, and from the first time I played it way back in 2001 to even now replaying it again in 2002, I still think it's one of the best games for not only the PlayStation 2, but just in general. Kept you waiting, huh? Hideo Kojima I think is kind of like the Quentin Tarantino of video game directors, and I feel like the guy's often frequently imitated but barely replicated, and there's always just something incredibly unique about everything he's worked on. We are the sons of the boss! Metal Gear Solid 2 might not have the emotional lows and highs of Metal Gear Solid 3 or the more polished and refined stealth mechanics of the fourth game, but it's kind of hard to deny the impact that this thing had, and there's a reason why so many people look back on it fondly. Metal Gear only has room for one! I still remember the sight of my parents coming home that day and seeing my dad carrying a PlayStation 2 under his arm and knowing that I'd finally gotten my hands on it. I mean, I think by that point, I'd played that original demo so many times that I'd started to damage the disc. You have to remember too that this was back in the early 2000s before internet culture was even a thing, so there were no mainstream review sites like IGN or GameSpot, not to mention there were no YouTubers with a bazillion subs to tell you how to think. Back then, we didn't really try to deconstruct games or analyze every single aspect. You'd just buy a game and kind of hope for the best. And in the case of Metal Gear Solid 2, well, it's one of those times that I think that risk paid off. I almost kind of feel sorry for people who missed out on that era of gaming. Do you know what I mean? Like, we just had titles back then coming out constantly, which were really just industry-defining experiences. No, that's not what happened. I mean, shit, man. Let's consider that in 2001 alone, we had Grand Theft Auto 3, Devil May Cry, Silent Hill 2, Halo, and Max Payne. So for Metal Gear Solid 2 to stand out amongst these titans and also arguably come out near the top, well, damn, that's saying something. What's also funny too is that it comes from an era where you'd get a trailer for an upcoming game and not only would the game often look as good as that initial footage, but in some cases, it actually looked better. Freeze. More. Now this is also a sequel that I think has had the biggest upgrade, not only visually but also in terms of the gameplay. And I think that jump from the PlayStation 1 version to the PlayStation 2 probably has to be one of the biggest graphical leaps of all time. I mean, go compare how Snake looks in the first game, for instance, to how he now looks in Metal Gear Solid 2. I mean, you can almost see the individual hairs on the guy's chin now. Yeah, and how about that next generation mullet? It's glorious. A mullet that, in my head canon, is really a reference to Jack Burton's mullet from Big Trouble in Little China. Who? Jack Burton. Me. Codec calls are back and they're now also fully animated, with the characters actually moving their mouths during these instead of them just being these 2D static images. No, I'm serious. And someone at Konami also realized that it wasn't really that much fun mashing the X button to get through these things, so now you can press the triangle button to blitz through entire conversations in seconds. No, I'm serious. Later in the game, the scale for some of these set pieces during these incredible cinematics, all of which are motion captured now, and backed by a score by Harry Gregson Williams are just leaps and bounds more detailed than anything we'd seen prior. That's Metal Gear! It's already active! The whole thing starts off on the outside of this giant tanker with the scrolling New York City skyline in the background and this rain effect that still looks impressive even by today's standards. You know what, I'd even go so far as to say that no other game since has ever captured that feeling of being cold and wet to the bone in the middle of this thundering rainstorm. I mean look, if you can name a game that you think beats it, well, then go ahead by all means. <laughs> when you go into first person mode, you can even see the rain droplets hitting the screen, as if it's, you know, bouncing off your own face. And in third person mode, you'll also see the rain hitting the characters. I remember in a behind the scenes video they said that it was easier just actually animating this on the character model specifically as opposed to calculating every single raindrop, which is also just one of the many little technical feats of wizardry that the game manages to pull off. So yeah, safe to say it didn't take too long playing this thing for the big bucks spent on that new PlayStation 2 to start paying for themselves. I know it might seem a bit dumb with me saying how good the game looks when most of my footage is from this HD collection that they brought out for the PlayStation 3, but even looking back to the original PS2 hardware in all that 480i glory, it's still one of the best looking games for the platform. 
Plus, there's just not really any other game that looks like Metal Gear Solid 2. It's got this really unique art style and aesthetic that's just never really been replicated. In fact, I'd argue that in some ways it even looks better than the third game. There's like a more simplistic and clear look to the image here. On the other hand though, that unmissable A-listing that came as a result of trying to recreate these dense forests kind of makes the third game a bit harder on the eyes. Well, you it's know, in awesome some ways. Unit. The forest environments, as good as they look, are really just the same as, you know, any other generic looking forest you'd see in a video game. The big shell and the tanker stood out amongst anything else you'd seen gaming at the time back then. And I think even now, if you look at a screenshot of either environments, you're going to instantly know where it is. And if you want to see a prime example of game dev squeezing as much as possible out of limited technology, well, shit man, this is it right here. Excellent speech, my friend. I mean, instead of just one location to explore, now you've got two. You've got the tanker and then the oil rig for the second chapter. And even the oil rig alone is way more detailed than Shadow Moses. More than that, though, are the awesome little incidental details, some of which you might not even notice, but your brain did. For instance, once you get inside that tanker and out of the rain, you'll even notice your vision is slightly foggy for a few seconds to simulate basic condensation. And in an even cooler attention to detail, if you spend too long outside to begin with, Snake ends up catching a cold and starts sneezing, attracting nearby guards. <coughs> That's part of what I've always loved about Metal Gear Solid 2, was stuff that they've added into the game, but stuff that never really needed to be. And it's just added in there on the off chance that someone goes off and starts experimenting with all these mechanics. Like there's a bar area in the tanker, and you can go behind there and just start shooting up bottles. In fact, you'll even notice you can shoot the individual ice cubes inside this bucket. If you plant C4 bombs on the swarms of sea lice and then detonate them in first person mode, for some reason a bunch of these things will then fly towards the screen and splat onto it like they're roadkill. The fuck is that? It's just a bit of an insane level of environmental detail to really make the player feel like they were gaming in next gen. And honestly, I don't think we saw environmental interaction like this on the PC until the release of Half-Life 2. You know, like three years later. Not to mention, next-gen bird shit. Yeah! yeah, run too quickly over bird shit in this game and you're gonna end up tits up. Ow! And yeah, how could I forget that it still might be the first, if not the only game I've ever played that had someone piss on me. And yeah, man, I'm talking full-on fire hose piss stream. But I think hands down the element which has had the biggest upgrade is how the cinematics are handled. That's what you think. Now that's not to make fun of the cinematics in the first game, and there were still some badass moments which were captured pretty well considering the basic limitations of the PlayStation 1. I think that shootout with Meryl and Snake is still pretty awesome, and watching Snake somersault to avoid an incoming tank shell is pretty damn cool. Send him a message. But there was a distinct lack of detail in some pretty key areas, you know, like the facial animation. Really? Where the modeling was really just these basic looking polygons with barely distinguishable facial features. You're strange. Well, all of that shit's now been improved. And you can look at a character now and get a better idea of what's going on inside their head. How's that possible? The first encounter that Snake has with Olga, you can see the arrogance and confidence on her face as she just thinks that Snake's another bozo trying to hold her up at gunpoint. I mean, if only she knew that she was dealing with a guy who's turned hiding into a cardboard box into an art form. It really does feel like you're watching a movie at times because some of these cinematics really do just seem to go on and on, which is always something that's been a point of contention for a lot of people. That opening scene on the tanker has Snake watching while these Russian special forces sneak on board and methodically execute all of these marines. And the camera angles, the choreography, and the music kind of make it feel like you're watching a Tom Clancy film. And then one of the most fun things to do was to go back in later into the theatre mode and swap out all of these NPCs around to different models. Plus, it also helps to re-establish these old characters and make them seem more capable. Identify yourself! Like, take Ocelot, for instance, and now consider that the last time we saw this guy in action was when he got his ass handed to him by a snake, and then shortly after that, when he had his hand yeeted off by the ninja. You were lucky. We'll meet again! 
Ocelot again returns as one of the main antagonists, really setting him up, I think, to become the foil for almost the entire series from this point on. I mean, he's kind of like the Biff Tannen of the Metal Gear Solid series. So what are you looking at, butthead? I mean, the dude even travels back in time, essentially, in the third game, and is still a major dick. That's major Ocelot to you. During this whole prologue sequence set on the tanker, he's shown to be an absolute badass. What the? <laughs> Rocking that revolver, a duster, and spurs, and showing again that he's a completely unpredictable wildcard. This time, instead of being told he's a badass, we actually get to see it. It also works to set up the boss encounters, like seeing Vamp for the first time obliterate an entire SEAL team really helps set the guy up as this unstoppable force of nature for the inevitable fight. And watching Fortune deflect incoming bullets and grenades, you know, again like it's nothing, helps establish their abilities as well. But more than that, seeing Snake throughout the entire game from a second character's perspective just ups that guy's cool factor by about a thousand percent. Snake! Been waiting long. Yeah, I guess I should probably talk about the biggest shock of all time when this game came out, was that you actually spent maybe 80% of the game playing as someone else entirely. So that's why you changed my code name. And after playing through that tanker section for a good three or four hours, suddenly Snake is gone, and instead you're now playing as a pretty boy named Raiden. A dude with bright blonde hair, a baby face, and a purposefully androgynous body shape. It's like someone took the lead singer from Hanson and made them a video game protagonist. And the fact they managed to hide this from pretty much everyone until the game launched is fucking astounding. Is this some kind of sick joke? I His appearance is so ambiguous that even the president has to go in for the old crotch grab to double check, because I guess simply asking was too much of a hassle. You're a man? Yeah, no shit. Long before this guy was a walking meme that went around killing guerrilla robots with a sword, he was little more than just a deer in the headlights, sent into an environment where he was arguably unprepared to deal with a threat that he barely understood. I thought so. It's actually probably a good thing that internet gaming culture and sites like Twitter weren't as big back then, because people bitched about riding back then enough as it was, let alone if we had to listen to fair weather fans throw their hat into the ring as well. What makes you so sure? Was it a letdown not being able to play a snake from that point? Well, yeah, maybe. But it's actually a pretty ballsy move from Kojima to do something like that. Plus, I remember he said that one of his main reasons for doing it was that he thought it would make Snake look even more impressive. You know, when you saw him from someone else's perspective, which I think it really did. Snake, I can't handle this alone. Okay, I'll take care of it. I'm going to show you how sniping should be handled. Take a good look. And anyway, controlling Raiden was exactly the same as controlling Snake. Only some of the animations were a little bit different. So it's not like you were playing as some kind of inferior character. Not at all. That whole weird subplot of Snake being in disguise too, calling himself Pliskin, again, another John Carpenter reference, going over the head of no one else but Raiden was also a fun way of handling things. Are you a Navy SEAL? That's actually, I think, part of what makes Raiden's story so interesting, is that we know right from the get-go that he's either being lied to or just blatantly missing the facts. Who is this? Raiden's been told that he's being sent into the big shell because the president's been captured by a terrorist group called Dead Cell. Kind of similar to the members of Foxhound in the first game, with their leader apparently being Solid Snake. Yeah, that Solid Snake. But I mean, from the get-go, we as players all know that that's completely horseshit. And that's the idea we're supposed to. Not a chance. And then it's about watching Raiden figure these details out himself and how he chooses to handle it. What's your name? Raiden. That's an odd name. Instead of Solid Snake, though, it actually turns out to be an all-new antagonist, Solidus Snake, which is the second long-lost and most evilest brother of Snake yet. Apparently, this guy was even the president at one point, and how no one ever noticed that he looks exactly the same as Solid Snake is anyone's guess. I mean, at no point did Campbell, Mei Ling, Otacon, Merrill, or even Snake turn on the TV. There's also a lot of similarities here between what's happening to what happened back on the Shadow Moses base, which of course we later learn is all intentional and part of the plan. This situation 
I find it very nostalgic. So this means Raiden again spends a lot of his time talking to his commanding officer up again Roy Campbell, apparently, along with a data analyst who can save his game. In Metal Gear Solid 1 it was Mei Ling, but now it's Raiden's girlfriend named Rose, a woman who has the personality of a fucking ironing board. I know that, and I know I need to stay stronger. But it even goes further than that. You start off infiltrating the base via a large freight elevator, you encounter like a weird cyborg ninja who warns you about claymore mines. Be careful, there are claymore mines around there. Snake, be careful, there are claymore mines around there. Just call me Deep Throat. Just call me Deep Throat. Deep Throat. And there's even a fun little fake out with Ocelot where the guy's smart enough to make sure history doesn't repeat itself. What? My hand! You've got a sequence guiding a Nikita missile, you've got a sequence involving torture, and then a fight against a bunch of Metal Gear variants towards the end of the game. Only, it's the anomalies that make things seem a bit interesting. Like that sudden appearance of this mysterious SEAL team member who seems to be very level-headed and know a lot about what's going on. Are you two with SEAL Team 10? I didn't see you at the mission briefing. Oh, we're with another squad. Bullshit! And yeah, if you thought the first game had a lot of weird fourth wall breaking moments, well, wait until you get to Arsenal gear. Raiden, turn the game console off right now. What did you say? The mission is a failure. Cut the power right now. What's wrong with you? Don't worry, it's a game. I still think that Snake just flat out referencing his infinite ammo bandana is about the funniest thing of all time. If you run out of ammo, you can have mine. You got enough? Absolutely infinite ammo. <laughs> and that's really what Sons of Liberty is all about. It's Metal Gear Solid 2.0. Cool. Now, one of the main new mechanics they've added was the first person aiming mode, which worked hand in hand with that new tranquilizer pistol. This not only added in a useful new mechanic, you know, being able to shoot and target enemies much more accurately, but it also kind of worked from a story sense. First off, I mean, it's simply because Snake's on this tanker under the impression that he's only going up against Marines. You know, upstanding innocent soldiers who are just doing their job. They're not terrorists or mercenaries, and I'm sure they'd rather be doing anything other than slowly escorting a giant weapon of mass destruction up the middle of the Hudson River on a cold-ass night. But more than that, I think it's also trying to tie into Snake's character progression from the first game. See, at the end of the first game, Snake had to deal with the fact that he'd spent a lot of his career as a soldier pretty much killing most people he came across. And if you played MGS1 the same way that I played MGS1, well, then you probably killed a whole bunch of people there too. So now in Metal Gear Solid 2, it's like he's got more of an altruistic look on life and he's not so keen on just murdering everyone he comes across. I mean, you can still kill people if you really want to, but I feel the game really makes a point now of making you feel bad for doing this. Death animations are incredibly gruesome, with enemies screaming and taking much longer to slump to the ground. And if you shoot someone at point blank range, well, that blood even essentially gets in your own eyes. Shoot someone with that M9 pistol, though, and they simply get knocked out and instead take a nice long nap. The skill comes from making sure you're accurate enough to hit those vital body parts like the heart or other parts. Because if you shoot them in the hand or the foot, well, you may as well go make a cup of tea because that's about how long it's going to take for them to then pass out. Really, at the end of the day, I think the most skillful way to play stealth games, you know, short of just avoiding everyone entirely, is going non-lethal. Unless it's a game where you've got no other option, leaving a sea of unconscious bodies behind in your wake is better than a sea of corpses. <laughs> Yeah, these bodies don't magically vanish anymore either, so you might even have to pick them up and drag them into nearby lockers or out of sight. It is kind of funny though, because you've got all these cool looking weapons that are very much lethal in nature, but something about playing the game that way just feels less satisfying to me. On this though, there really is no debate. I think if you play a stealth game and kill everyone, well, you're an actual scrub, and your family should just be embarrassed to even share blood with you. Metal Gear Solid 1 might have introduced the concept of non-lethal playthroughs, but Metal Gear Solid 2 really established it. And you can now get through the entire game without killing a single person if you know how to, and that of course goes for bosses too. Plus it also worked in tandem with my favourite new mechanic in the game, where you can sneak up behind people and hold them up at gunpoint, causing them to drop their dog tags. Freeze! <gasps> 
this became really important because collecting enough dog tags is going to unlock those very important new game plus items like the bandana and the stealth suit. And honestly, there's few things as fun in gaming as it is messing around with the enemy soldiers while your stealth suit's equipped. Anyway, that holding up mechanic is just so fun, and trying to find a way to get behind every single guard without them seeing you is what kind of made every area into almost like a mini puzzle, as guards would often have these really erratic patrol routes. There might even be guards who'd be reporting their status back to HQ all the time, and if these guys were unconscious for too long, they'd even send in reinforcements to investigate. So you'd have to make sure that these guys went down last. It was nothing, all clear. Once you got someone at gunpoint, it's pretty much as easy as aiming it at a vital body part, you know, take your pick, and then they do the shimmy shimmy shake and drop their dog tags. These guys won't wait around forever though, and if you just stand there for too long without doing anything, you can even see that they're gonna slowly lower their arms back down to grab their weapon. Freeze! <laughs> but I think even more cooler than that was those assholes who talk back to you. Are you going to shoot me? Kinda makes sense that not everyone would be enamored by the legendary Solid Snake, which kinda meant that they'd be less likely to cooperate. What are you? So, what do you do with these guys? Well, you fire off a warning shot right near their stupid heads to let them know you mean business. Don't kill me. I actually found out years later that you could shoot near them to achieve this effect. The first few times I played through this game, I thought you had to wing them or kneecap them, which I always kind of thought was really cruel, watching these poor guys hobble on one leg or try to hold up their now wounded and quivering arm. But hey, nothing shuts someone up quicker than catching a bullet to the kneecap, let me tell you. Don't kill me. It just adds much more of a skill-based element to the stealth here, considering otherwise that whole mechanic is pretty barebones stuff. I know that a lot of the stuff that made its way into this game were ideas that random employees at Konami would apparently come up with. And again, going back to that behind the scenes doco, they said that people who worked at Konami at the time would often submit these random ideas to Kojima, some of which would be added into the game. And I like to think that someone at Konami here came up with this holding up mechanic during their lunch break, which, you know, went on to become one of the game's most unique features. Just try to pull the trigger. And there's a reason I think why people have made these hour long videos on all of the stuff that you can do here. You know, from sending Otacon photos of all the pin up models and hearing his reactions. Oh, this is a... Uh, what? Nothing. It's nothing. To wanking off inside a locker, because, yeah, that's a thing in this game. No, that's not what happened. Now, when it comes to the stealth system, it's again by and large the same as the first game. Enemies patrol the area in a preset path and have a giant field of vision cone that you need to stay out of. That much is unchanged. When playing as Raiden, you need to log in each time you enter a new area for the first time, which is kind of a weird addition, but after that, it's essentially the same system. What happens when you're seen, though, is quite a lot different. Now, compared to Metal Gear Solid 1, where every enemy seemed to be part of a hive mind, and would all suddenly know your exact location, in Metal Gear Solid 2, that enemy has to first radio for reinforcements. It's the enemy. I need help. If you're a good enough shot, you can just outright shoot their radio, preventing them from making that call. And for maximum gamer points, you can even do it as they're about to make the call. It's the enemy. I need that. Oh. If reinforcements are called in though, this is where it starts to get a bit more intense, because instead of it just being the same generic soldiers with FAMAS rifles, now it's these heavily armoured guys with riot shields and shotguns that are going to make your life a living hell, forcing you to retreat into a nearby room or vent to get away. And if they know you're hiding in a specific spot, then they'll go into like a breach and clear mode like they're a bunch of Rainbow Six Siege sweat lords, pushing in and checking all of the hiding spots to try to find you, most often successfully. Gotcha, bitch. But even if you manage to still stay hidden, everyone in the air is going to go into a caution state for the next few minutes, with a heightened awareness and a dope soundtrack to boot, making it much trickier to stay hidden. There's even a couple of times where I've noticed there's going to be a guy guarding the exit to the area to make it even more harder to slip by unnoticed. And I kind of get it, I mean, it makes sense, right? If you saw a guy running around with a bandana and a super high-tech sneaking suit, well, you'd kind of want the boys to hang around for a bit of backup, right? This, I think, has always been one of the best new advancements that this entry added in, and the way these guys methodically check a room is realistic and impressive stuff. I know they had a military advisor helping out on this thing, and you can really see where the money got spent there. When you watch these guys close range, you can see their tactics in play. 
Now, you can fight back against them. I mean, it ain't impossible to kill them, but like Metal Gear Solid 1 before it, it's still a game that's about subterfuge over outright combat, at least most of the time anyway. So at some point, you're gonna fire off your last AK bullet or use your last ration and have to hightail it out of there with your bandana between your legs. <laughs> So what's kind of something I missed about the sequels too was where it just kind of seemed to go back to a more simplistic approach with enemy reinforcements, where they just kind of materialized out of nowhere during combat. Either way though, it means you want to remain out of sight and out of mind most of the time, and that's not too hard to do considering how basic the stealth really is. I think outside of a couple of loud surfaces, you can pretty much run right up behind everyone without them being none the wiser. With them being none the wiser. Fuck. Freeze. <gasps> when Metal Gear Solid 2 came out, it got a lot of comparisons to Splinter Cell, which is kind of fair, but also unfair in a lot of ways, simply because they're really taking completely different approaches to the genre. I mean, it's like comparing Quake to Rainbow Six or Gran Turismo to Mario Kart. <clears throat> On the one hand, Splinter Cell is a stealth game with a story attached to it, but Metal Gear Solid 2 is a story with a stealth game attached to it, if that makes sense. Yes, there are stealth mechanics and it labels itself as tactical espionage action, but they're really just the means of letting you get to that next set piece, that next cinematic, scripted event, or boss fight. Stop. And when I think back to playing this game, I always think back to those key moments. Stupid machines! Less than I do think about the specifics of trying to get from point A to point B. I mean, I think back to sneaking around the outside of the tankerous snake, immersed in that atmosphere as I'm drenched in rain. I think of fighting Olga in the top of the ship, but I think of fighting back against the Russians in that narrow corridor, and then sneaking past those clueless marines as they're engrossed in that speech. Getting absolute freedom and autonomy though in how to get to that next key point is what makes the game so fun. But it's still the cinematics that garner the most criticism, because love it or hate it, you're still going to be watching most of the game unfold in these unskippable cutscenes. You know, as much as you are controlling them during gameplay. We have little time, so I'll be brief. Even though, funnily enough, I think Metal Gear Solid 2 has the second shortest total cinematic time out of all these four original games. <laughs> And it wouldn't be a Metal Gear Solid game if you didn't have to sit through a bunch of cinematics, along with beating some outlandish bosses in these cordon off areas. Oh yeah man, we're going there. The boss fights. This should be fun. Now compared to Foxhound in Metal Gear Solid 1, the main enemy faction this time is called Dead Cell, and there are less of them this time. I think Metal Gear Solid 1 had around 10 boss fights, whereas Metal Gear Solid 2 has 8. And I think the fights in this one sit somewhere between the third and the first game, you know, with the third game obviously being the best in the series. Of course. The first one is playing a snake against Olga, and initially it seems pretty simple, but it can play out in some neat ways. For instance, you've got a spotlight which can be redirected into your eyes at any time. Then there's also a flowing tarp which can make spotting Olga a lot more difficult. The entire fight is about line of sight, and the idea being that when Olga's in cover, you can swap positions to get a better angle so she can't see you. Plus, it pretty much forces you to come to grips with the new first-person aiming mechanic, you know, hammering that feature into new players. Ah! It's kind of like the Ocelot fight in the first game, only this time the player has more control and awareness over where the boss is and how visible they are. Ah! The next boss, and I say that in quotations, ain't until later in the game when you're up against Fortune, the badass railgun-wielding, bullet-deflecting femme fatale. And for this entire fight, you can't even put a dent in her. That's because apparently she's the embodiment of Lady Luck and she can't be touched. Yeah, I wonder how she goes when she tries to take a shower. It's actually kind of brilliant though, because for this entire fight, you're just running around trying to not get vaporized. And if you're anything like I was, well, you're probably shitting your pants the entire time as the room crumbles around you. But it also kind of teaches you how to dodge. And that's a skill you're going to have to use later on when you have to fight a factory lion's worth of metal rays. The next fight though is a lot more dynamic, taking place on a helipad against the bombs expert, Fat Man. As the guy moves around on roller skates and plants explosives, you're gonna need to defuse with a coolant spray. This guy's heavily armored, so you're gonna need to knock him on his ass, and then plant a few rounds in his dome when it's exposed. Again, something that the first person aiming is pretty much essential for. Oh! The ensuing Harrier fight is kind of like the Hind D fight in the first game, only dialed up to 11. Now taking place during the day, so you can actually see what the fuck you're looking at. The Harrier also moves much faster than the Hind D does, and the arena is also split over two levels, giving you much more hiding spots. All up, I think it's one of the coolest fights in the entire game, and I never get sick of hearing Solidus praising Raiden here for landing a hit. You're tougher than I thought! 
Vamp's fight, easily the one that's been hyped up the most, is also I think the most complex. Ah! This guy jumps around like a flamenco dancer, leaping underwater and jumping out to throw knives at Raiden if you stand still for too long. And if you don't manage to shoot out the lights around the area, he's somehow able to pin your shadow to the ground here, paralyzing you. And again, in a bit of a testament to how much stuff they've crammed into this game, I only found out years later once walkthroughs became commonplace that you could shoot stinger missiles into the water to draw him out quicker. But all of this pales in comparison to the fight against the Metal Gear Rays. Fuck. The fight against the Metal Gear Rays. Oh, shit. Now look, there's a handful of things I've done throughout the decades that I've been into gaming, things that I hope to never have to do again. One of them was shooting all 200 pigeons in Grand Theft Auto 4, and another was getting through this Metal Gear Ray fight on European Extreme. The fight itself is pretty simple to explain, it's Raiden and a Stinger missile launcher against a bunch of Metal Gear Rays. These things don't wait their turn though, and even when they're not on that center platform, they'll still be launching missiles at you from a distance and taking cheap shots. So it's a combination of throwing out chaff grenades to offset their lock-on abilities, but also just having awareness of where the other ones are at all times. And the whole fight doesn't end until you've defeated a certain amount. The thing is though, compared to the other boss fights, which just increase the damage you take, this fight on the highest difficulty mode increases the number you have to get through. So on normal difficulty, you might have to beat like maybe half a dozen or so of these things, whereas on European Extreme, you've got to beat upwards of two dozen. And if you make a single mistake the entire time, then you're gonna die. Then you have to go all the way back to the beginning. And I think this, along with that motorbike chase in Metal Gear Solid 4, are the single hardest sections to get through in the entire series, if you're going for that European extreme run and to try to get that illustrious big boss rank. I expected a little more fight than that really makes that final fight against Solidus kind of seem anticlimactic in comparison, not to mention almost like something out of an entirely different game. Let's go. Then again, maybe going from fighting giant robots with a missile launcher to a showdown with samurai swords against a dude in mech armor ain't all that far-fetched. Now, the main complaints I have for this game definitely have to do with its pacing. I think the tanker chapter is about as close to perfection as a game can ever get. You're constantly moving on to the next thing, and it never feels like it stops being interesting. The only downside is that the whole thing has to come to an end. Looks like you were long overdue for retirement. Once you reach the big shell though, it does kind of start to lose its way for a bit. The first hour is this gauntlet of mostly cinematics and codec calls that you can't really afford to skip, unless you want to be completely in the dark as to what the hell's going on. Right and watch out. There are sentries posted on the connecting bridge. They will spot you if you continue on course. You get your basic objectives, you have to sneak past a few enemies before then seeing Vamp and Fortune in action. Though the cinematic with Fortune is pretty awesome and it does give us one of the best lines of dialogue in the entire series. A dirt! But then it has this whole sequence where you're working with the SEAL team bomb disposal expert. My name is Peter, Peter Steelman going through every single structure on the base to find and disarm all these bombs with that coolant spray. Now check the floor, ceiling, walls, under a table, everywhere. Try to imagine the locations the bomber would choose. Yeah, and get used to that coolant spray, man, because it becomes a pretty frequently used item throughout the rest of the game. From being able to use it to put out fires and waking up sleeping guards. <laughs> This can be incredibly tedious though the first time you experience it, as you've only got items to give you an indication of their general area, but not their specific location. And then, after almost every single one of them, you've got to listen to a codec conversation between Raiden and Stillman. Raiden here. I took care of the C4 in Strut C. This is Raiden. The C4 found in Strut A has been frozen and disposed of. I have the last C4 frozen. There's nothing showing up on the sensor now. And it's kind of like Raiden is constantly seeking validation or something. I mean, dude, just, just get on with it. Good work. Then after that, you finally got that showdown against Fat Man, which, yet again, reuses the whole coolant spray mechanic. Good work. For the next few hours after this, it does become pretty fun again. You've got to infiltrate the main strut by disguising yourself as an enemy soldier, and then sneak around a room full of hostages to find an undercover agent. And this is when I think the game is pretty much at its peak, because wearing that enemy uniform pretty much makes you invisible, and you can get away with murder, literally, at this point. 
All roads from this point on then lead to finding and rescuing Otacon's sister, Emma. You're lying! And after that Harrier fight, getting there involves what I always thought was one of the most confusing sequences. Well, you have to swim through a bunch of these flooded corridors, which seems way more complex than it actually is. I figured out that the trick here is to look at the map, not what's on the screen, and also trying to avoid swimming into all those floating mines, obviously. <laughs> But I think the only other time that I've found swimming as nerve-wracking in a video game is all the underwater sections in the Sonic the Hedgehog games. Apparently too, Kojima even wanted to have sharks in this area that you'd have to outmaneuver and get past. And let's all just count our lucky stars that someone at Konami put a fucking pin in that idea. You're lying! Along the way, you'll also contend with Vamp and meet the dick-grabbing president, who I didn't mention happens to be named Johnson, by the way. Hmm. And then after finally reaching Emma, you realize you now have to go all the way back to where you started, also dealing with an influx of new enemy patrols. And it's not that it's hard, but it is just very slow and tedious, and you can't really afford to rush through this stuff because of how fragile Emma is and this weird allergy she has to being shot at. Yeah, imagine that. Then it's all finished with what is easily, I think, the worst section in the entire game. Having to watch Emma from afar as she slowly walks across this floating walkway while you take care of flying drones, claymore mines, and yes, more patrolling enemies. So essentially what you've got here is what's more or less a two to three hour long escort quest. Is this some kind of sick joke? And then what ultimately happens to Emma, which is horrible by the way, is also amplified by the frustration of just having done your best to keep her alive for the last couple of hours. You know, only for the whole thing to be in vain. I gotta give it to Kojima though, this does all end with what is possibly one of the saddest moments in the entire series. But the thing that gets me here, it ain't Emma dying man, it's seeing Otacon's reaction to it. You can actually pinpoint the moment that his heart breaks in half. Emma! Emma! Answer me! You can actually pinpoint the second when his heart rips in half. And... now! I mean, the poor guy gets to reconcile with his sister for a matter of minutes before she's taken away from him. You know what, I think Otacon is the real victim of the Metal Gear Solid series, never mind Snake. You're strange. Then the last few hours of the game are just really non-stop action. From that awesome shootout alongside Snake inside Arsenal gear. What are you thinking? And then Raiden's final battle against Solidus. <laughs> yeah, let's consider to it a game that ends with a funky jazz track, which only minutes earlier had a dude getting chopped in half with a katana. Yeah, that right there, that's the Metal Gear Solid 2 experience. The one main takeaway that I always get from playing this game is that I'm playing something that's really one man's singular thought process turned into an interactive medium. I mean, Metal Gear Solid 2 is obviously still a collaborative effort, the tireless work of countless Konami employees, but it's still Kojima's vision at the end of the day. And regardless of where he went after this or how the series might have ended up, there is like an essence of finality and refinement to this game that just makes it feel so perfect. It's before he had all these other storylines and factions from the other games, or before he had to go into damage control in the fourth game and bring everything back together again to make an iota of sense. Snake Eater might still be my favourite game in the series, but Sons of Liberty is the one that added the most to the formula. And while the difference between 2 and 3 is incremental, I think the changes from 1 to 2 are fundamental. If you're going to do it, then do it. <laughs> it really helped to usher in a new generation and standard for cinematic games, especially for the PlayStation 2 and the Xbox era. And the fact that a lot of these sequences still stand up is a bit of a testament to how ahead of its time they were. So whether you choose to play it on the PlayStation 2, the PlayStation 3, or somehow get a copy of the PC port, it's still a really unique gaming experience that's about as tight as the duck's asshole. You don't get to fight battle-scarred lingerie models or a guy shooting wasps, but it still has the moniker of being one of the few games that lets you get pissed on, and that, my friends, is worth the price of admission alone. <laughs> What's going on? Snake! 